Okay, back to our final video. We're going to look at, okay, what about America? What is America doing during all of this? Because, of course, this is American history, and it's important for us to really understand where America failed. Um, at this time, Franklin D. Roosevelt is president of the United States, and he has offered a he is supporting the American policy of isolationism. Remember, during World War I, uh, Woodrow Wilson also supported a policy of isolationism, which did not last in World War I. Um, but Franklin Roosevelt is once again saying that we would not interfere with international affairs. He says the U.S. will remain neutral. However, we will supply allies under certain conditions with the things that they need under the Lend-Lease Act, which is a big part of this. Um, Franklin Roosevelt was third term in office in 1940, and he tells the people, your boys are not going to be sent into any foreign wars. That's what gets him reelected. Not able to hold on to that promise and that policy, but that is the policy of the United States in 1939. All right, so the Lend-Lease Act, very important document that you do need to know. What the Lend-Lease Act does in 1943, the U.S. government and Congress passed a $11.1 billion appropriations that would go to European nations who were allies of the United States. And basically what it said is we would provide shipping repairs, production facilities for our allies to repair ships, to repair um, factories and facilities that they needed. We would provide agricultural products and we would provide industrial items so that they could continue to manufacture what they needed to manufacture. Another part of this bill was munitions. We would supply them with planes, tanks, guns, uh, automatic weapons, bombs, and they would simply get those from us. Now, a lot of people in America uh, believed that that part of the Lend-Lease Act did not uphold neutrality, that by doing this, we were actually picking a side and being involved in this war. But when FDR gives his state of the or his inaugural address at the very beginning of his third term, he is able to um, convince the people this is the way to go. Um, the notice factories, the president of this factory here tells the company, we will not accept war business, so don't expect a war boom. Uh, we will just go on making barbed wire to keep American cows where they belong. Um, it was very confusing to individuals because we began to step up the production of barbed wire, ammunition, guns, tanks, weapons, things that we weren't necessarily needing at that time. But the idea was, oh, we're not doing anything. We are um, leaving this for other nations to fight. And so, oops, um, political cartoon uh, that, that kind of made its way around was uh, had to do with the dogs. Uh, I'm neutral, but not afraid of any of them saying, look, we're neutral. We're not involved in this fight. But that doesn't mean that we are afraid of you. And so that, that was the American stance. Um, and so the Japanese threat, big thing that happens there. Um, ja Japan had gotten many resources, especially steel and oil from the United States. Uh, but when uh, Japan begins to move into French and British colonies and the Philippines where there were American troops, this causes a conflict because they are, number one, they are fighting against our allies. And number two, now they're getting into territory where U.S. troops are stationed in the Philippines. And we don't like this. So in August of 1941, the U.S. enforced an embargo against Japan. We basically stopped sending them oil. We said, we're not trading with you anymore. You are not. You are a threat to our allies. We are not trading with you. And so General Hideki Tojo, who you see here, um, did not want to hold talks with the U.S. He said, I don't want to talk with you. I, he, he started planning an attack on U.S. soil, figuring that was the best way to respond to this embargo. And so, as you know, in December of 1941, um, the Japanese warplanes attacked Pearl Harbor in the early mornings of December 1941. It was a surprise attack uh, aimed at our Pacific fleet. Uh, killed almost 2,300 people, most of them military, but also civilians. Um, the next day, Roosevelt declared war on the Axis powers, and he gave one of his most famous speeches. Um, in which he stated that yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. No matter how long it may take us to overcome this premeditated invasion, the American people in their righteous might will win through absolute victory. And so he told Tojo, he says, look, you awoke a, sleep, a sleeping giant. Um, keeping in mind, this is the location of Japan. Tokyo in relation to the Hawaiian Islands. And so um, they went through um, 
we was right on the outside of their uh, command, of their influence. Um, here are some pictures from that morning at Pearl Harbor, the attack on the USS Arizona, um, the blowing up in the Pearl in the Harbor. Okay, the, the remains. Um, one of the biggest political cartoons uh, put out during this time where they're removing the hand of the Japanese. Uh, Uncle Sam is removing the hand of the Japanese from Pearl Harbor, stabbing Lady Liberty in the back. We'll remember, and by God, you won't forget, was the um, message sent to the Japanese. Um, now, here is a very controversial aspect in American history, is that we had a lot of Japanese Americans, sending it. many of them never had been to Japan in their lives, that lived on the West Coast and in Hawaii, and they were very successful business people and farmers. They supported the United States. They had never done anything against the United States. Um, but after the attack on Pearl Harbor, their loyalty to America was questioned. And so Franklin Roosevelt, in an attempt to save the American people for American safety, forced the had the forced removal of Japanese Americans to what are known as internment camps. Um, these internment camps were located in the Western states, um, as you can see on this map, where they were located in different areas, 120,000 Japanese Americans were sent. Um, almost 65 percent of those people were American citizens. Um, they were not Japanese. They were American citizens who had citizenship in the United States and lived under the Constitution. Um, in these areas, they lived in crowded barracks, as you see here, um, herded in. Many times this could be seen as like a concentration camp. Um, they were forced to live there for about two years, go to school there. Um, this was a time of great um, kind of humiliation on their part. Um, notice that even during this time, they were still very faithful to America, um, that kind of thing. You can see where they lived, um, how they lived. Notice the housing um, that they lived in, how they lived and worked within their families. Um, on the home front, we see the increase in production. Of course, during this time, we did have to ration or limit the amount of goods that we could buy. There was a coupon system, and you had so many coupons that allowed you to buy a certain number of products. Factories, though, were producing a lot of wartime equipment. Okay, um, Eight ways to make your fuel last longer. And those oil was greatly restricted during this time, and so they would give people pointers on how to make oil last longer within their homes. Um, notice the production of tanks, wartime production greatly increased, which me meant that more women had jobs in the workforce. Six million women entered the workforce during World War II um, because they were so needed. Um, they earned better pay, although not equal pay to, to the men. Rosie the Riveter was a famous icon for American women. Um, this is the beginning of a social movement where women realize, look, we worked during World War I. We're back at work during World War II. Um, it inspired this social movement. And so here you see Rosie the Riveter, the women working in the factories. Okay, really inspired. You got the iron workers. Okay. Um, African Americans, also a huge part of this with the Tuskegee Airmen. Um, although the military was still segregated, Franklin Roosevelt refused to desegregate the military. And this is 1942. Amer African Americans were fighting for America during the American Revolution, and they still did not have equality, even when it came to the military. Um, the Double V campaign was launched at that point, which meant for a lot of African Americans, look, we're going to win the war and the victory over fascism, but we're also going to get a victory at home. We're going to win a victory over racism and prejudice, which is one of the reasons that the civil rights movement is going to take off in full force after World War II, because this becomes a huge movement for those uh, groups of people. Um, you can see here the colored regiments, as they were called, which was very insulting to groups of people, um, were very important to the victory of the Americans. And so they use that as that opportunity to say, look, we can do this. We can be equal in society. And so the Tuskegee Airmen, group of African-American squad flyers. And so the last couple things, uh, a victory has to do, um, the very last video is going to deal with victory. Um, so it'll be a much shorter video dealing with how did we achieve the victory in Europe and in Japan. Um, so this is the end of American beginning involvement, and we're going to end the war in our last presentation.